This is Maharajas of Skill, a podcast where we go behind the scenes and talk to founders who are demolishing the myths around building and scaling a big business in India. These are the stories that have shattered the assumptions around Indian consumers and are changing the game completely. I am Krishna Jonakardla, serial entrepreneur, co-founder of Flit, the fashion locator in town and startup mentor, bringing you these stories. Hey listeners, this is Krishna as always from Maharajas of Scale. Today we have another Maharani of Scale, Anindita Sampath of Yoga Bars. Anindita is seeing some interesting patterns in the, you know, COVID-19, current COVID-19 uh, situation. We will talk to Anindita about what she's seeing in the COVID situation uh, a little bit into the episode. But otherwise Anindita, welcome to the show. Tell us what you're working on right now. Tell us a little more about yoga bars and some interesting numbers about yoga bars. Thanks, Krishna, uh, for having me on this show. You know, like you were saying, it's a very interesting time, a very interesting, difficult time for all of us. Uh, you know, in terms of managing the ups and downs through the through this crisis. So for us, uh, in the beginning, it was a lot about how to manage or how to balance out a lot of things because on the one hand there is we are a pretty small company still so you know how do you manage or sustain the company versus making sure employees are safe employee welfare is met you know uh, we don't have to go to the extreme of people's jobs security and all of that stuff was very very important in the beginning and we kind of have uh, crossed that hurdle now uh, you know like you were mentioning earlier food comes back into the essential goods segment so we were able to start up our operations a little earlier you know maybe in the middle of april we start we were able to start off our operations at a smaller scale so over the last you know cup last month we have been able to stabilize but it's 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 been a very challenging process because there are lots of uh, interesting dynamics which keep getting thrown up uh, on a day to day basis and you know there, there is no there's nothing to help us understand how to uh, navigate through it so it's 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 literally like a day to day uh, response to those challenges i see so tell us about yoga bars a little more what did you begin with uh, where are you now and what sort of numbers have you achieved sure uh, so we started uh, we started about 6 years back uh, and i started the company with my younger sister swasni and uh, you know the genesis or the reason for starting the company was uh, just just one single question saying you know why isn't there more healthier food available in india you know we did feel like a lot of the biscuits bread you know usually what we use you know usually most of our consumption which happens outside the home uh, it's it wasn't like it wasn't expensive it is expensive in some ways but the quality of the food and the price that was being charged was you know there seemed to be a lot of disparity there um so it just started with that one question why can we try and do something in this space because again food is something that's you know roti kabra or makan right so i mean it is something that's so the food makes a lot of difference to people's lives and uh, as we depend more on uh, convenience food is there a way to make that healthier and better than what is there in the uh, what was there in the market at that point and we started off with just one line of products we started off with uh, with with our snack bars and now uh, we've grown um, you know we we have like three uh, three different lines of bars uh, we entered the muesli category also last year and uh, uh, we are bringing out a lot more options uh, you know savory options as well and we're looking to grow into a lot more categories as we have you know as a as people we have gotten more familiar or more open to healthier eating we are looking to grow into many more categories at this point and that's something which keeps us very very excited um in terms of numbers um you know just in terms of you know distribution points uh, we are at around 6000 7000 stores right now uh we sell it, uh, sell through all our uh, all the marketplaces and we've we've seen our sales double more or less double every year uh, for the past 2 3 years interesting and how many consumers might that be that's an interesting question uh, i don't know I, i think it i think it you know we sell about maybe 6 to 8 lakh bars per month uh and the muesli is another uh, I, i don't know so it must be around maybe Two, two, two to three lakh, two hundred to three hundred thousand customers at this point. That would be my rough estimate. Uh, on a monthly basis. On a monthly basis, yeah. But also, I, also a lot of people are trying this category. I mean, health food is not a 
it's 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 not like a namkeen category where people are you know it's a new category so a lot of people enter the category and then uh, the stickiness of it is not a uh, stickiness of the customer is not yet uh, built in to such an extent right right so health bars india uh, that is pretty interesting uh, was there uh, a larger context to why you decided to start something in the health space uh, was there a personal situation was there anything that you had encountered it was in the per- uh, so personal situation yes i used to trek a lot uh, i i used to work in the us at some point and i used to trek a lot so i used to use a lot of these bars when i was in the us and i'm vegetarian also so i mean in terms of food options you, you don't really uh, restaurants can give you only that much so i used to eat a lot of these bars um and my sister was also studying uh, studying there at wharton and she used to stay with me and i wouldn't cook at that point of time so i used to give her a lot of these bars to like kind of uh, snack on and stuff when she was on, uh, when she used to go to uh, study so you know so it, it was just the it's so convenient and even in terms of nutrition and stuff uh, again from my personal standpoint for a vegetarian it's very difficult to kind of if you you know if you're not very used to cooking and stuff it's very difficult to say i've got the nutrition i need so it just worked great on those two uh, aspects and i think that's that's you know that's where it was like uh, you know with india seeing such more and more people uh, working where both women and the men are working it, it just seemed to be a product that would work very well in the indian context as well interesting i have uh, you know i i lived in the us for over a decade and um, the the funny thing about diet in the us is uh, while uh, the last leg of my life there was in texas which has a pretty you know deeper or la- let's say there are quite a few indians there so you do get a lot of options yeah but the other places in the us uh, are vastly different the diet tends to be either heavily sugar based or it's mostly meat based and i'm vegetarian too uh, the 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 weird thing is all of this cereal is mostly a sweet break sweeter breakfast right you know the fu- funny thing is uh, about a 22 years ago uh, i was in andhra pradesh doing an audit hmm. uh, and a junior of mine who happens to be from uh, uh, rajasthan uh, he woke up in the morning and then he said uh, where can i get some uh, jalebis here i said uh, dude you are in andhra pradesh and uh, for crying out loud nobody eats a sweet breakfast in andhra pradesh yeah true <laughs> right and uh, so if at all anything all you're going to find is some savory or something uh, spicy and then andhra pradesh being a spice capital all you're going to get is that sort of stuff so how how did you rationalize uh, i suppose your south indian and south indians are even more heavily biased towards uh, you know the spicy uh, the savory kind of breakfast how did you rationalize that was it that the changing indian consumer the indian taste or uh, convenience all of that together that you decided to go with the bars concept so i think you know so you're absolutely right so i used to, uh, i did my engineering in, Pil- in pilani and uh, you know the jalebi matri thing used to happen like every sunday it used to be like a special you know special breakfast was ja- was jalebi matri and all north indians used to be like you know best best breakfast kind of thing it uh but coming back to the savory and the sweet option um i don't think it was a question of rationalization uh it was more the question of giving people the option you know and that's the thing uh the thing is uh, a sweet something sweet does not need to be 100% sugar you know sugar if there is sweetness it can be much more pared down as well to still make it healthy and that's you know that the thing was to give people the option to choose and to give people the option to choose healthy as well i think that was the bigger thing that we were trying to address uh the savory was the sweet yes that's a very valid point i mean i think uh, i hadn't seen those statistics at that point of time so it really did strike me too much at that point and later uh, you know there were I, i've read a lot of articles which say that 80% of the market ready to eat market in india or 80 to 90% is based on savory uh, and it's not sweet but for us at that point the question was can we do something healthier than what's there in the market and that's about all the question that we were trying to solve i see and something that 
did not require cooking and something that was yes. portable and uh, mm-hmm. would fit with the busy lifestyle of uh, people yes yes the convenience factor was like the biggest uh, was the second biggest factor yeah okay any prior uh, entrepreneurship experience uh, personally or are there any entrepreneurs in the family no none uh, no my dad was a chartered accountant uh, i mean every, it's a very very professional uh, office going family uh, there, there was no there is no prior entrepreneurial experience either personally or in the family i see okay so when when did the two come together uh, because obviously providing a healthy option meant uh, you had to become an entrepreneur or did you not t- think too much about it the whole passionate idea about providing a healthy option was was that just you thought about or how how did this whole journey begin so i think it was a couple of things one is just the idea by itself uh, i think in my in our minds it was very clear that the market was there the other was is it you know i mean it, 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 um, is it something that we can do you know it, it was just those two questions we didn't ask ourselves too many other questions outside that it was we'll try and we'll take it step by step you know we'll we'll start we'll try something if it works we'll go to the next step next step next step we didn't really um, ask ourselves like too many questions in terms of you know how big can we get it what does it take to get 5 years down the line or 8 years down the line it was very much okay this is this is our target this is our two month target this is our five month target uh get there and then think about next i think in our minds it was very clear okay this can become uh, there is enough potential in this so the only other question that was left to answer is can we uh, can we realize that potential or not and uh we said we will do it without asking uh, without you know overburdening or overthinking it just just work at it as we uh, go on you know as take it step by step yeah very interesting how do you eat an elephant uh, bit by bit i suppose yeah i guess yeah but uh, <laughs> not a lot of entrepreneurs actually go through uh, you know this kind of practical uh, thinking most of them uh, i i meet a lot of them uh, who fall into either end of the spectrum the ones that are completely naive and then have no clue and that actually stops them from doing anything and the ones at the opposite opposite end of the spectrum who literally are just dreaming big dreaming big and then strategizing but really not taking any action there is an old saying uh, it's attributed to the you know st francis of assisi uh, which is which is something i follow practically every single thing that i do start with what you know and start with what is possible and suddenly you are doing the impossible and that's what he says so yes uh, i would agree i think i think it's a lot about just you know i i think uh, you know when people ask me i mean so i think it's it's a little about just staying the course you know uh, you you just have and there's a lot of circumstances also which affect whether things go well or don't go well uh, but and that's something you can't really control but i think keeping in mind things that you can control and uh, just staying the course i mean not that just getting to the next day next month is i think you need to give yourself that uh, uh, that a uh, window to do that and uh, i think overthinking things sometimes doesn't help too much right right so let's dive a little deeper in into that starting point in india there have always been homemade options available even today it is um, very common uh, very common to find homemade uh, savories homemade let's say the peanut uh, bars that all of us eat you know called chiki but in order to create a product which you perhaps uh, you know experienced uh, uh, i'm sure in the us as well as in india meant that it had to be professional it had to be branded it had to go through a uh, certain manufacturing processes it needed a certain investment so how did you go about the initial product and how did you rationalize the th- this is not a while tech products also take some amount of initial investment but this is a le- this is a physical product right it means you need to take space you need to purchase or lease out machines it, it could go a little deeper into that starting point sure so i think the first uh, you know the first pilot as such we worked with home bakers to kind of have some kind of product done uh, you know because uh, 
just to see what what is possible what is not possible uh, we worked with a few home bakers and uh, said okay fine this is the product we tried and sold it in a few yoga studios not in a very big way i mean it was like 100 bars just kept it out at the reception and saw if people are picking it up or not i mean that was pretty much what the experiment was about because you know because apart from the investment on machines and things like that there is also the question of can you uh, get to the consumer and that that usually tends to be the most expensive you know expensive part or expensive part of a fmcg company getting it, the marketing and the advertising bit so the question was is is there enough pull that if we don't do too much of advertising if we don't spend too much of money on advertising is there still some pull in the market that we can generate sales and i think bangalore is a very good test city for that because people already tend to be a lot more open to i to newer ideas compared to say a bombay or a chennai uh, bangalore tends to be very open to trying out new, new ideas so that was step 1 step 2 was how do we manufacture and uh, how do we manufacture this at scale and how do we invest i mean and the thing was at that point of time uh, the bar industry as such is not was not such a big industry that you have outsourced manufacturers you know as your industry matures you have a lot of you usually tend to get more people involved in the space and it's easier to to approach people for advice on how to do things uh but in a lot of ways we were kind of pioneers in the bar industry in terms of manufacturing it in india itself and selling it in india so i mean whether you believe it or not a lot of our initial uh, knowledge was through youtube and food factory videos wow you know so i we used to, yeah i mean that 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 was pretty much what it was you know it was like i check youtube videos you know there there a lot of videos over there which right. show you how bars are manufactured equipment uh equipment uh, manufacturers have put up with videos which they have taken at different places so that i mean literally that was the source of uh, knowledge for us and uh there the, there was a show which comes on i think discovery or something which is called food factory in which they take you through uh uh-huh, in which they take you through all these uh, mega factories and how things are done there so i think it was kind of like uh you know seeing the two ends and saying okay fine uh, how do i scale this down to a level where i can do it and i don't know i mean so that's what we called a lot of equipment manufacturers uh we called a lot of people who manufacture for chickies you know uh, uh, equipment which manufacturers used to manufacture chickies we, we got those machines did trials uh and uh, customized them to work for bars and uh, how do we finance it uh, it took a bank loan we have pretty much financed it and uh, because it's in the food sector uh, you do get some grants uh, grants and stuff from the government so applied for some grants and we started off with something like 25 lakhs that's that's how much our first factory was literally 500 square feet uh, and i think 10 lakhs 10 12 lakhs was the machinery and another 10 lakhs was working capital and uh you know and uh, raw material purchases and things like that and then from there on it was more like a learn and uh learn and expand kind of uh, experience that helped us go through it very interesting seems like a very practical uh, looks like uh, you're a very practical person i i see nothing but practical stuff all over this i mean imagine Uh, working with a few bakers uh, i i was i was not expecting that at all and uh, so le- so let's expand that a little bit that initial uh, test that you did well there are bakers you know baking is one one of those uh, hidden hobbies or uh, creative things looks like you know there are a lot of indians now getting into baking uh, perhaps maybe finding them was not that hard but let's dive a little deeper uh, when you worked with those bakers Uh, how many yoga studios what sort of feedback did you get from the users uh, did you have to change the product drastically or which which actually turned out to be the most effective i think the markets or for our, i mean finding the bakers is not difficult um, you know like like you said there enough bakers out there finding the baker, uh, bakers was not difficult uh, but what you make in a kitchen and what you make in a factory scale is very different you know how do you scale because uh it, it's just a question of how you uh manufacture on a line you know uh right so there, there there is a lot of scale up required over there 
and customer feedback as well you know so i mean i think the product kept changing first two years the product kept changing you, you know it's i mean it was a lot of actual on shop floor experience in terms of how so even how ingredients interact you know a baker usually bakes something that's eaten within 24 hours they don't really care about shelf life or they're not tuned to think about shelf right life right uh so something like dates probably works great in a homemade bar uh but the minute you're talking about uh, s- uh putting out a product with 2 3 months shelf life dates doesn't work so well i mean there's this you know it's it's not that stable that it will work very well for a 2 3 month period so i think the learning came from everywhere it came not only it, it came a lot from putting the product out and seeing how customers react seeing how the product reacts and there are a lot of challenges in india you know like we were talking about the us market us market is completely cold chain you know it leaves the market it leaves the factory in a air conditioned vehicle it reaches the shop you know everything's cold chain everything's temperature control right uh you know is in a country like india you have like te- different temperature zones you know so even seeing how the product reacts in different you know you send something to delhi it reacts the customer feedback is different from what you'd you'd see in bangalore itself so i mean the feedback was from everywhere uh and that's what i mean cu- the first couple of years it was just a lot of iterations of the product uh, process uh, product iteration so in in those first couple of years it was not necessarily test or sampling you sold sold the product so the initial product itself was it uh neatly branded nicely packaged did it look like a factory made bar or was it like a homemade bar no it was very much like a homemade bar uh it was uh you know it, it was very much like a homemade bar i see i see and then what's what sort of feedback did you get i think people were i mean i think i i think bangalore is a much kinder city than other cities honestly so i think most of the feedback was very encouraging you know uh it was very encouraging i mean it was definitely to the thing about uh, you know even if the product even if people were like yeah what is this product why are you charging so much for it it was you know when you explain it to people people were like yeah healthy products are needed my product might not have been the best product at that point of time but at least i i think in terms of encouragement we got a lot of encouragement um uh, even when we went to retailers like we we went initially to namdaris and stuff it was more okay uh, you're trying to do something different let us let us help you in the way we can uh you know so there was definitely a lot of encouragement from people and not not only from customers even from retailers uh you know uh, people in you know hr uh, in a lot of companies they were like yeah you know you're doing something different uh let's see if we can help you i mean obviously the product stands by itself in the end but what help people could give they were very open and willing with that interesting so at what point of time did you feel that the time was right and therefore you had to do commercial grade and you had to do factory grade but or was was it all sort of a loosely evolving state of things uh no i think uh, uh, i think a turning point for us i think a couple of turning points uh, actually one was uh indigo at some point they ordered like a huge number of bars for uh for their uh, not for their customer consumption not for the in flight consumption it was more for uh their staff uh because they said you know people are uh, working throughout the day they don't have time to like stop and eat they're running all the time uh, it's important for health is important for them so they actually gave us a huge uh order for uh all the flight attendants and pilots and stuff and uh i think you know maybe doing some 10000 bars per month and the indigo order was about 60000 bars per month uh you know so it was a huge uh huge jump for us and managed to do it how did it happen how did the order itself how did you land the order that was just talking and asking people krishna i mean it's uh, pick up the phone and call and <laughs> <laughs> you know tell people you're doing this is this uh, you know uh, no no other way to do it it's it sales uh, amazing yeah suhasini was like on the phone all the time uh, you know talking to people and uh, trying to connect with people and getting that done interesting interesting please go on yeah so that was one point and the other point was also uh, with online kind of picking up in the country 
uh, because I think about four or five years back was when online started doing, you know, started picking up. And uh, we had a very basic website, like extremely basic website. And I think, I, I think after the first order came in, it was probably about a week before I saw that an order had come in on the website. Because we weren't accept, expecting any sales. It was okay, like just make a website and leave it. We'll see what happens. Uh, there was no advertising, no Google advertising, no Facebook advertising, nothing done. But orders started coming in over there. So I think those two were pretty much what the turning points were for us saying that, yeah, let's go to the next step and see how to make it work. Interesting. Interesting. And when you began the hypothesis that you had about the Indian consumer uh, and the market and what you actually eventually saw pan out, were they different or was it was it that the, the thoughts that you had uh, were actually uh, validated? Um, I I don't think I uh, so I don't think I had preconceived because I I'm not I was not from the FMCG space at all so I didn't have any uh, you know any notion about okay customers you, the consumer it's this or nothing or anything of that sort but a lot of people whom we talked to initially where like health does not sell in India uh, India is not a market where health sells uh, it is a taste market. You do need that huge, spicy, uh, high flavor products to sell in India. If you continue like this, you are always going to stay at a small scale. Uh, that was feedback that we got continuously from a lot of people whom we talked to. You know, and I, I think the markets evolved a lot from that point. You know, so f- from there to now, if you go to any retailer, if you have a healthy product, he's much more open to even listing you. So. I think perception of the Indian consumer, I think the consumer has evolved a lot from that, from from when we started, for sure. So you're saying health does sell? Uh, health is something that Indian consumers are increasingly aware of. And I think they're also understanding what is healthy. It's not just an advertisement telling them, you know, it's, it's not an advertisement telling them this product is healthy. I think people are questioning that also much more, you know. Uh, so if a bigger company just comes out and says, okay, I'm healthy, I don't think the consumer accepts that uh, straight off. Uh, paying the premium for a actually much more healthier product, I think the, the, the consumer has started making that decision consciously. You know, in the, in the US, um, protein bars and uh, you know, all kinds of meal replacement bars, all sorts of bars, you, 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 get, you get like a thousand varieties of them. And the funny part was uh, whenever I used to eat them, they usually used to be if if a bar was even halfway tasty, forget uh, you know being the taste shocker kind that you get in India that it had to be rich. Even if the bar was uh, halfway tasty, there would be some downside to it. It would be sugar or something of that sort. And that was one end. The other end was if you picked up a really healthy bar, and I'm not kidding. It was expensive. No, it was. It virtually tasted like cardboard. You know, forget being expensive. So, so I always used to think: hey, Is there no healthy alternative? Is, isn't there? A, is there something that is that tastes healthy, but uh, that tastes good, but is also healthy at the same time? So, it looks like uh, you po- possibly hit the sweet spot there. <laughs> I hope we hit the sweet spot. <laughs> Uh, I think I, I think for the I, I I definitely hope that we've hit the sweet sweet spot there, but uh, I think the other part of the equation is in terms of cost and the premium that you uh, you can't have one without without the other because I think a better quality product will cost you more and that's that's the bottom line, uh, you know. Uh, so I think that's the other side of the equation also which people have, should keep in mind. Right. So let's uh, talk about that uh, scale journey a bit. Uh, when you started uh, a, a few handful of uh, yoga studios, and then um, um, you, you spoke about the Indigo order, and then um, you know the online coming in. Uh, but as you pointed out in the beginning, uh, FMCG and food, uh, whether it's in the West or in India, is largely a distribution game, right? So. While online can definitely be a decent chunk of the orders, um, people still go to stores, people still see things, uh, and a lot of India is still uh, physical, um, uh, notwithstanding Big Basket and Amazon Fresh and all of that. And that same, that's kind of true of the US as well. 
um, so talk about that scale journey a bit how was it cracking uh, beyond the uh, some of the initial positive feedback that you got from anamdaris which is a fantastic chain by the way so uh, how was how did you crack distribution and how did you start you know climbing on the scale journey uh honestly krishna one thing is i think we started a little earlier i, I think uh, uh online distribution has got a lot more competitive in the past couple of years i think we were a little lucky that we started maybe just right before the competitiveness actually set in uh you know so uh, uh retailers were a lot more open and a lot more uh willing to list new products and try and do it on a try, a try and uh trial basis at that point so that i think played in our favor a little bit but at the end of the day what a retailer cares about is if you have a uh, throughput in the store uh there's there are also some other things like margins uh listing fees and things like that so retailer cares about those things so it is about uh, you have to make sure that there is enough throughput in the store that you're listed at uh, that's the bottom line because unless there is uh, enough throughput he's not going to make his money so whether you choose shops or you know you see where you want to list uh, make sure that there is a uh, rotation of uh, stock in those places uh, i think that's pretty much the game that's pretty much you know, regardless of what else you do that's the bottom line in the retail uh, market he has to make money uh, he has to make money in the business in the you know by stocking your products and selling them he has to make money and you have to ensure that for him and there's also a question of relationship management it's very important to have a sales your sales team interacting with the because you are at the end of the day a very new product uh, they don't know your whether you have enough uh, financial muscle to kind of like push through products and things like that so your sales team has to give them confidence in terms of what you're doing uh, that you will you will stay in the you, you're there for the long haul uh, it's it's a lot so a lot of it is relationship driven through your uh, sales team as well right F- feels like you just said you didn't come from the fmcg space but uh, hearing you talk feels like you've been do- doing this forever <laughs> six years of very very hard experience let's talk about some challenges that you faced along the way what what were some challenges uh, did you have any for a business of your sort i don't know if there there was ever a near death moment w- was there a near death moment what were and what were some of the methods or you know solutions that you adopted that got you out of that near death moment so the near death moments basically happen whenever a funding is in uh, I, i don't know it, it's it, it goes back to money uh, legal business again uh, uh, money in circulation is basically what what causes any kind of uh, uh, stress uh, causes a lot of stress uh, did we face yes there were a lot of points where it felt like you know uh, it's you know uh it's going to be tough to see th- see things through uh but i don't know somehow we got through it uh i can't i think it was just again like um having some faith and just pulling through to the next stage um i think this coronavirus stuff could have been a very 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 difficult situation you know it's something that no one can account for it would have been a extremely si- difficult situation if this had happened a year back i you would have probably shut because you don't have the scale to kind of sustain yourself through something like this now we are in a little bit of a better position but i think with scale with growing with uh, increasing scale i think the challenges are one is uh, i think it's a lot to do with people you know because uh, right at the beginning people are very used to working in a di- in a very organic way um, taking responsibility taking initiative uh, and that works wonderfully for a small company right as you as you grow you are bringing in people with more experience also into your company you know so they their experience is different from uh from how people work in our culture so to have someone new come in and work in our culture that's a huge challenge and and people are very very important to scaling a business right I think the other part is also in terms of products, product portfolios, 
a lot of times you know sometimes suddenly the sales will stagnate for some time how do you how do you sustain that through through you know multiple multiple periods um that's kind of a business uh, issue that we kind of face and i i think we figure out how to do that but i think the biggest challenge is in terms of uh, managing people and building a good team interesting you should touch upon culture uh, what's what's the culture like uh, at yoga bars you've gone from being a, a company that put out bars to multiple products right now uh, you must be doing some things right oh we have a very very flat organization structure i mean everyone uh, i mean i think it's uh, i think when people from outside come in it's a little bit of a shocker to them <laughs> how flat we are and how there is absolutely no uh, what do you call it filter between how people talk regardless of their designation so uh, I, i think the kind of people feel very empowered in the they f- I think they feel a lot of sense of empowerment and ownership. I think that's that's I think what I would say the culture of the company is and that's largely because I think uh, we don't we really don't have any hierarchy. Uh, hierarchy in terms of reporting structure is there but there is no hierarchy in terms of how uh, anyone is supposed to talk to someone else or you know uh, it's not like oh you're senior to me therefore I cannot I have to like serve madam you or anything of that sort that that kind of thing is not there it's a very uh, i don't know I, i would say it's a pretty empowered organization at this point very ownership a lot of ownership that people feel so on the growth trajectory uh, and and i'm very conscious of the fact that in spite of possibly scaling to lakhs of uh, consumers compared to the kind of scale that you can achieve in india you you're still scratching the surface if you will that's that's just the size of the indian market but uh, getting to where you where you got where there's some things that you did vastly differently because in the fmcg sector uh, you know my family has been in the fmcg distribution business uh, for the last four decades ever since i have uh, i can recall maybe my oldest memory is when i was uh, about uh, 10 years old and uh, i was writing out a wholesale sale invoice um, for uh, cadbury's chocolate bars so and then i would go along with the sales guys of hindustan lever to start pushing retailers to take st- uh, take um, stock you know from brookbond tea to uh, wheel soap so uh, a lot of channel stuffing you know if you if you understand the term does go in uh, but beyond that now the market is different i understand uh, but so there there is a set of healthy tactics there is a set of unhealthy tactics that is used in fmcg uh but that is something that you'll be aware only if you've been in that industry for a long time right so but uh, coming in as outsiders uh what were some inflection points in the once you got beyond the initial scale uh that uh, you know worked in your favor i think the thing is you're not i mean uh, i don't know i mean i think the thing is uh you're not bogged down by saying this is the way to do things or you have to do things a certain way I mean I think for us our attitude has always been like try if it works it works if it doesn't we figure out something else you know so I mean and uh, you know like you were saying channel stuffing for example you know you overload the stores with stock and then do whatever promotions and stuff to clear the stock from there right uh one one fact about our products is because we don't use any preservatives the shelf life is about 3 of it's about 4 months that's extremely short shelf life for an fmcg product in india because i mean you, you lose about 15 days in stock getting to the retail outlet itself and again there was something that people said okay you can never i mean people in the retail industry were like you can never work with this kind of shelf life in the market it's impossible i mean I, we we don't i think the thing with being a smaller company is you don't have anything to lose you try and i i, I think it's it's that burden <laughs> burden of not knowing <laughs> a burden of knowing is not there so you pretty much try what you want to try um i think the cost of trying is lesser for us than uh, a bigger company uh, and that's how we approach it so uh, i i don't think we preset and accept saying that okay this is not how it's done uh, it that's not something that we uh, that we kind of like go by at all 
it's like okay it does, that's that's not the way it's being done fine understood but let's let's see if we can work something else out okay so i think that's 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 kind of helped us i don't know if i answered your question yeah and in terms of a philosophical response but in terms of tactics uh, and methods uh, where there's something different uh, uh, that that actually worked out for you in maybe reaching a new set of retailers or maybe new distribution points uh, where there's some tactics or maybe something you did online that actually helped you grow from let's say when you were hitting 25 50 a uh, 50000 bars that put you in the 300000 volume i don't know i think it's it, it it's being about like even the distribution points everything it's about it's about building that building a team and empowering the team to take decisions so let's go a little deeper into that distribution in the fmcg market uh, at least in india the way that market has operated is when it the manufacturer itself usually doesn't provide credit to the supply chain the distribution agents in between at least for the established what i've seen for the established fmcg company so for instance if you were buying from uh, johnson and johnson or hindustan lever the clearing and forwarding agent would actually buy the stock and then eventually all the way to uh, to the wholesale redistribution agent uh, it is always on the basis of payment you they are, take payment in advance and actually pass on the inventory the credit to the end retailer is actually provided by the redistribution agent right so that's the typical fmcg chain but um, as you know as uh, that chain also is getting flatter and flatter you don't have that many layers in between it has twin problems one is if you do not extend credit many times you may not see the uh, upline sorry top line that actually come in right so because people are saying okay the retailer is saying hey your shelf life is 4 months I'm going to realize possibly sale only 45 days later so I cannot pay everybody in advance he's possibly saying that so did you have to work with that or uh, did you have have to adopt any credit tactics or finance tactics to increase your uh, spread so I mean what you're talking about the CNF agent works for much bigger companies uh, you know where it's completely like cash and carry basis your distributor you know they have a structure of super distributor and you know that goes down into the thing but uh smaller companies you know like you rightly pointing out it's not there is the question uh, you know your retailer is not going to take uh there, there are credit cycles right uh 15 day 20 day 30 day credit cycles that you have to uh, extend credit in the market but that's normal across uh most companies except your HUL and uh Colgate and you know bigger behemoths um uh, Right. Everyone else outside that will follow a will follow a credit policy. Will will have to extend credit in the market. Uh, but you do have retailers like Dmart. Their payment cycles. And the question is with the discipline with which you are able to implement it. Because uh, the thing is, uh, if your retailer is saying ten ten days credit cycle, fifteen days credit cycle, uh, are you making sure that fifteen days is fifteen days, or does that credit cycle get extended out? Uh, I think that's the discipline that. has to be implemented within a smaller company uh because you can't keep extending that credit cycle and to your earlier point about confidence this so, which is which is why you have to make sure that there is offtake in the shops that are there because where is the the retailer you have to realize that the retailer is there to make money and he has to make money so it is important to make sure offtake you have to make sure that the offtake happens in the stores whether you choose your stores where you're 100% sure the offtake will happen that's one way to do it but that offtake you can't put the retailer at risk he's your partner he's your best salesman also over there um who you know who, who's going to recommend you to the customer so you don't you don't want to upset or lose him as a as a partner in your way so you have to extend credit to them so that's interesting so let's talk about that uh making the retailer you know financially viable making the product is financially viable you know, the traditional indian market is made up of two two sorts well i guess three outlets right now the online outlets where potentially the prompt or a a, a banner ad or a banner prompt will say hey you might like this uh, which is like a soft recommendation or sometimes a hard recommendation you have the supermarkets where you unless you go into a big bazaar 
where there are bonus paid uh, sales uh, girls and sales boys who are actually prodding you to try a particular product and then you have the traditional retailer uh, who mostly is a mix of maybe 20% of them are very conscious of what their users need but the vast swath of retailers are not necessarily recommendation driven and um, especially for a product like yours which uh, is not supported by vast amounts of advertising you are yet to get you know that kind of eyeballs or even visibility uh, how do you crack that equation that equation where you uh, ensure that there is off take the peel that off take on you in a little bit i think so i think online actually helps a lot so even though uh, you have so even though the sales so the thing is i think the online advertising does create product awareness uh, and that we we've seen that you know translate to offline off take as well uh because we used to run a few experiments in the beginning say, saying that is this uh does this make sense or not because online ad- advertising can be very expensive also if you say okay online advertising and this is your online sales do those numbers actually make sense probably not but the minute you stop online advertising you see the impact on your offline sales as well so one thing is to run you know to uh, to run that online advertising uh, continuously the other thing i think that helps is you know uh, recommendations like again we uh, sampling at offices and stuff um, so that helps a lot awareness of what's a healthy product the thing the thing is about putting that product out and uh, the association if it comes from a uh, from a um, you know uh, if it comes from a known source or if it comes in an environment where people you know people are more open to the idea uh it helps that they go and ask the retailer uh the retailer actually does recommend a lot if whether he, whether they are aware or you know depending on how your sales person communicates to the retailer the retailer will recommend or not recommend your product uh but the first thing is to convince the retailer about what your product is about uh there is actually a lot of recommendation which your uh, end retailer will will make because because a lot of times he's the only person who's there in the shop and a person is going to you know a customer is going to go up to him and ask boy you know what is this product what is there something new in the in your shop and things like that so it depends a lot on how he's selling your product as well interesting and uh, i have seen uh, and i have to share a personal experience with you i i won't name other competing brands that we used to consume uh, funnily enough um, when i mentioned about uh, uh you know the interview with you uh my wife told me that hey that's the brand of cereal we currently consume at home and we haven't tried the bars but we've certainly tried the, the cereal or rather that is our staple uh, that we eat and i must say they're uh, quite delicious but uh, you are actually part of a set of startups in india that is actually bringing a really quality game to the uh market right uh, id batter um you know when you look at their packaging look at their branding your packaging your branding is really on par with the best in the world uh, so in terms of being able to do that within the indian context we haven't the quality of things has only started uh, changing recently in india we do get a lot of good stuff and many times the quality that's coming out of india is now positively surprising so when you started creating this packaging creating this branding uh, did you face any challenges locally did you have to go outside or the indian ecosystem has actually evolved no i we, we didn't go outside for packaging the packaging was completely done very much driven by suhasini and me but it was done everything was done in in, in india itself uh, but i think what the point the bigger point that you are making i absolutely agree with that i think uh i think there are there are a lot of uh, companies which are actually challenging status quo and saying that uh, uh you know indians does not mean you have to give bad quality you know i think uh, one is uh, demanding better quality products and uh, i guess uh, people are willing to pay the price for quality i think that's that's that i think that's a very refreshing change in uh, in india it's not like okay these products are there isi se kaam chala so it's that's that's not the case anymore i think a lot of companies i mean i think a lot of companies are challenging that status quo and i think that's a very very good thing for the ecosystem as such 
uh, I think the level of complacence which was there before has uh, it, it's, it's not there even with the bigger companies right now. Right, right. So what sort of uh, run rate and uh, numbers are you at right now? And what sort of growth rates are you seeing? Uh, I think we closed, uh, we closed uh, last year about 20 crores. Uh, that's net revenue. Uh, and we are we're growing it around, we're growing pretty healthily right okay. now. Okay. Double that number next year? Yes, for sure. <laughs> Okay, that's awesome. And uh, uh, you're profitable, I suppose. No, 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 we're not profitable, no. Operationally profitable? Yes, operationally profitable, yes. But uh, there are there are a lot of expenses. And we are in the growth stage. Uh, it's not it's not like hugely unprofitable or anything, but we are still in the growth stage. We are looking at a lot of investments. We do invest a lot in our uh, facility and people as well. We're growing our teams, so we're not, we're not profitable. Okay. T- talk about your funding journey a bit. Uh, the initial one, uh, I think, wisely was uh, driven by bank loan. I suppose to the extent it covered working capital and uh, equipment. Uh, but beyond that, uh, how uh, talk about your funding journey a bit? Uh, so I think the bank loan was one part of it. The other part of it was also friends. Uh, you know, a lot of, not a lot, a couple of Suhasini's friends and my friends uh, put in money. It wasn't like a lot of money, but it was uh, pretty significant uh, at that point of time. Uh, so they, the friends and family, fa- you know, uh, my sister, my elder sister put in some money, my aunt put in some money. So uh, there was some money which came from friends and family in the beginning. And then uh, we raised some money from Fireside, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Fireside, okay. first from Kanwal. How large was that round? Actually, actually, first before raising from Fireset, we'd actually raised some money from Kanwal, uh, and that I, I, I can't remember. I'm not very good with numbers, but uh, uh, and then and then later on from Fireset, I think it was about five crores uh, that we raised. Yeah, so uh, I think yeah, so that and then it, it's there's there've been a couple of follow-on rounds, one fall, couple of follow-on rounds since then that we've done. So in terms of the personal journey, uh, do you feel that? This has challenged you. This has uh, grown you. Uh, have you ever uh, been frustrated, or uh, or it's it's a mix of everything? It's a mix. Yes, to all of the above. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. It is a very challenging journey because uh, you really don't know. You really don't know what kind of challenges you're going to face on a day-to-day basis. And a lot of times, it is very very exhausting as well. Uh, it's just the amount of energy that it requires out of you. There are decisions that you have to make that you're not very comfortable making. I don't know, people impact also. I mean, end of the day, you know that what you're doing impacts people. Con- consumers, yes, but also on a closer closer level, people working within the company. You know, so I think the num- you know, obviously when you're, you, I mean, you are taking decisions which impact so many people. It's a very different, it's a very different uh, enriching experience, yes. Um, but it can be very stressful. It, it is also very exhausting at times. Yeah. Let, let's talk about the, the sibling equation. It's um, working with family has its share of uh, advantages and disadvantages. While uh, I don't know, it, it could come across as a, a you know a bad observation, but I've seen that you know sisters. Uh, can either be amazing buddies or you know sworn enemies uh, <laughs> so i i suppose your amazing buddy is the other version here how is how is that trusting another sibling especially um, both of you deciding to junk your careers and then go full time into this must have taken some nerve and then some courage uh, how how did that happen i think the trust factor was never in question uh, you know there is at least in our case, the trust factor is like 100%. I mean, there is just no question about that. And that's, I think, the good part. Egos don't come into it too much. Uh, it, 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 it's just not there. Uh, I think the thing which is mu- which is much more difficult is if, um, you know, a personal situation uh, is being faced by one person, that personal situation is being faced by both people. Uh, you know, so that impact... Uh, it's exacerbated. It's much, much more. So, I mean, if you're friends, I mean, one person can take over for another person. But in our situation, if something requires more attention, it requires both of our attentions. It impacts both of us the same way. So that kind of, 
which means that the impact on work happens twice as much you know and you know like you were asking me earlier in terms of experience i think it also uh, it has an impact on how relationships develop as well i think it, it does test relationships uh, it does test how you react to situations but uh, i think that also shows that also results in a relationship developing i think uh, uh, it's test by fire it's, it's i guess it's it's what i want to test by fire or whatever but that's that's what it is like uh, but i think the good part is between sisters i think the ego ego equation is not that uh, drastic as i don't know in most other sibling or maybe if it's a husband and wife i think the ego thing would be a lot more stronger but between us there's absolutely uh the trust and ego is at it's uh, ego is at zero trust is at 100 so that that helps us a lot awesome so where do we see yoga bars going next what's in store for the next 5 years <laughs> uh i don't know we just want to a uh, lot more products i think i think that's what we are focused on uh, a lot krishna because uh, you know like a few things that we had said when we were starting off we said you know at some point when people go into a store they should see there should be one uh, you know like shelf which has just yoga bar products and everyone should know that those are healthy products to buy i think that's what we are gunning for and i think a lot of it is to do with getting out some really good products which more people can relate to uh, i think that's 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 where we are we are focused on do, do you keep uh, do you maintain a kitchen or some sort of a test factory uh, somewhere where you're trying out constantly trying out new ideas or new recipes how do you approach that yeah we we have a test kitchen uh we have a test kitchen uh, at the factory itself um uh, and i think we i don't know again uh, it's uh we start with taste first we say okay leave everything no actually i, I think what we do is we say uh, ingredients don't ever go outside the set of ingredients so we say we take the healthy ingredients and this is this is this is what you have to play with and we want to get a product which does a b c d e and then try all combinations and let's see how that goes uh so the constraint is you know we're saying the ingredients that are going in are going to be the good ingredients so we never have like a bad ingredient to even start with so that doesn't come into the picture at all so you start with healthy ingredients and say now let's figure out uh um, you know what are the combinations the healthy tasting combination that we can get out of this interesting uh, you know what what what's the what's the end product look like uh you know do do we want to do a bar or do we want to do a muesli so yeah so we say ingredients this is your input and then output is you know do you want to do a muesli do you want to do a bar what is the end product what is that going to look like and then we say input is this output is that uh figure it out after that nutrition in your in how much protein how much uh, fiber all that goes into specifying what's what's an output uh, what's part of the output and then pretty much uh, combine these ingredients to get it so let's talk uh, a little on the personal side um, i'm while well, i'm certain that being an entrepreneur even 24 day uh, 24 hours in a day sometimes is not enough uh, what's the personal side like uh, what what keeps you going what do you do for to bust stress or what are some of the what's the personal side of anindita like <laughs> uh personal side i mean i i do do a lot of yoga uh, it is very important for me so i do i'm keeping fit is something which is uh, top of uh, mind top of top of my things to do um i travel quite a bit so i uh, yeah and then there is work i guess uh, you know i think that's that's pretty much it okay any family yet family yeah i mean is that is that a question saying am i married are you married do you have kids anything of that no 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 i'm i'm, I'm not married and i don't have kids no okay well usually uh, so has so has yeah so has me just had a baby uh, six months back so she, she keeps us all uh, uh, excited and stuff at home it's one big family i suppose busy at home yeah yeah Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So let's let's understand what how you feel about women entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm and pardon me here. I usually don't ask this question for the uh, to the others, but women, uh, especially the perceived notions of how, what it takes to operate in the Indian ecosystem, 
uh, with um, mostly everything being at least perceived to be a male dominated ecosystem uh, did you ever feel that was a challenge uh, and what would be your you know two cents to women who are thinking of you know starting up on their own or going it uh, alone out there I think the two cents is filter out stuff which is not useful uh, you can't uh, change how other people behave or how other people talk uh, or what their perceptions are so filter out what is not just filter it out it's it, that you know uh, it's i think that's the only uh, way to I, I, that's i think that's the only way to get ahead uh, filter out stuff which is not useful to you i mean did we face uh, yes i mean everyone has a set of circumstances that you face uh, some people have it easy some people have it difficult but definitely some things to do is to get uh, you know uh, get have a good sounding board uh, it could be a guy or it could be a girl but uh, have a good sounding board someone whom you can talk to and get some uh, get very practical advice from you know how to manage situations how to uh, you know how to how to interpret what other people are saying just have a very good sounding board that helps a lot for sure and i think if, yeah and i think some i mean the other part of it is you have to be a little uh, buffalo skin thick skin uh, you know just let the stuff flow off don't take it personally maybe that's that's probably it so on that count uh, entrepreneur being an entrepreneur well you're you're in this at least with your sister to a certain extent uh, you have somebody to lean on and then maybe say hey you know i didn't expect this maybe during a tough time and even when you're having a great time you know to share that moment but it is those blind spots essentially those times when we actually are not sure what to do and then in an entrepreneur's life there tends to be a lot of it while if an average person's life also tends to have quite a bit of it the stakes many times aren't that high right so so that sounding board uh, that's amazing so have you consciously cultivated a set of advisors or mentors that you uh, go back to when you are faced with a decision or something you know that uh, fo- that is forcing you to clutch at the straws Yes, absolutely. Uh, you have to have people whom you can, whose advice you can trust. Okay. Uh, and you should. Uh, and the other part of it is, you should not feel uh, embarrassed about asking questions, or you shouldn't feel like. Uh, I, I think the other part is we feel. I think a lot. Maybe this is a little bit to do with the Indian. You, you know how we are taught to think, uh, but asking questions is not. Uh, I don't know a sign of weakness that you're showing to someone. Um, I think just. ask questions because if you don't ask you don't know uh and def- definitely cultivate that uh, people whom you can, whose advice you can trust so are these uh, uh, uh vcs or friends or uh, entrepreneurs of other companies um friends the the advisor the advisors yeah yeah no the advisors i think people with uh, relevant industry experience are very helpful in that way no i i mean your advisors particularly Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm. Uh, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it could be your initial angel investors. I think they are, you know, because angel investors usually invest more out of passion than anything else. They really want. At least this is what I have seen. They, they want. I think they have. Uh, they want to enable change or uh, enable someone else to succeed. Uh, so they usually tend to be a lot. Uh, they tend to be very good sounding boards. It, it depends. I think anyone. So I, 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 you know, you go to different people for different kinds of advice. And definitely, if you have a good friend circle who's involved, I, I, a lot of my friends, yes, they are in the, they are in the space, and I don't hesitate asking them. Um, a lot of friends, parents, for example, have been around for a lot longer in this space, so they are also. I use them. Uh, I do talk to them as well. It, it's just whatever resources you have. Uh, I, I, you shouldn't feel shy about uh, connecting and developing them as sounding boards. Very important, right? A- especially as women. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you read? Are you a reader? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I do. Okay. W- w- what's the most recent interesting book that you've read? I think I can't. Uh, I'm very bad at uh, my memory is not so great. Uh, but I think it was the other, and then there was the other. Uh, I, I, it, it's it's about uh, I think it's a British author and it's about you know it's a it's about a painter 
actually it's pretty interesting that you asked me this question now because it's about a woman painter in the renaissance and then kind of connects to someone uh, and she had to like uh, actually uh, dress as a guy because they wouldn't accept women painters but she was a she she was a woman painter from the renaissance and then it connects to a modern day uh, modern day uh, a parallel as well so i think the name of the book is the other side the other i think it was the other interesting interesting amazing awesome what is your source of inspiration anybody that you look up to or anything that you follow my source of information uh, inspiration is actually much closer to home it's both my parents uh <laughs> okay it's not I, i mean it's 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 actually yeah it's, it's yeah awesome yeah, you your father's a chartered accountant uh, you your mother is she a professional as well oh no no she's not okay she's a homemaker well this is fantastic and uh, for uh, the listeners of maharajas of scale any words of wisdom in terms of starting up uh, you've said a lot of practical things uh, the episode itself has uh, a lot uh, for them to gorge on any anything that you uh, would like to summarize on or say hey these are from three or four things to bear in mind i think the only thing is not to overthink something uh, do it and then see if it's something that you like you want to stay invested in but thinking about things is not uh, and keeping things in your mind is properly uh, uh you know like you were saying earlier it's something that it's easier to do something and and then uh, move forward rather than think about doing something so i think that's pretty much words of advice <laughs> yeah well very 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 grounded and very very down to earth it just reflects uh, the journey that you've gone through anindita this has been a fabulous conversation uh, very rich insights uh, and full of humility uh, i'm sure we'll see yoga bars scale uh, greater heights uh, we will the uh, maharajas of scale will be there to cheer you <laughs> and uh, talk to you again um, you know when you hit that next uh, milestone and then subsequent milestones after that we need startups like yours in india Uh, especially the ones that bring pragmatism uh, and a no nonsense approach to doing things uh, no wonder uh, you've come this far and then i'm sure there's a great journey ahead of you uh, it's been fabulous uh, it has been great to have you on the show thanks so much krishna uh, thank you so much it's it's been lovely speaking to you as well we hope you enjoyed the story if this story made a difference to you tell us by leaving a comment on the website or our social media channels Help us spread the love by subscribing, liking and sharing our show. We welcome speaker suggestions and collaborations. Write to me at nida@maharajasofscale.com. At